Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. This is one of those really fun days for me because we are revisiting with one of our, dare, dare I say, one of our kind of our first guests when we yeah. were starting, right? Five years ago, you were just a young whippersnapper that had this idea for this nonprofit, and then all hell broke loose. We had these pandemics. And bless your heart, you didn't give up, you kept going, and now you're like a super success. And so Thank we you. wanted to check back in with you and discuss kind of your journey and what you've learned and what you are learning and what you've overcome. It's not always rainbows and unicorns, as we know, in the nonprofit sector. And so this is going to be a lot of fun. Another thing that's a lot of fun is I'm joined today by one of our co-hosts, Mitch Stein from Chariot, coming to us from New York, uh, Midtown Manhattan, correct? That's correct. Right here in Midtown. Wow. Amazing. Mitch is one of our new co-hosts, um, cohort of the co-hosts. <laughs> and uh, it's just been a delight, Mitch, to see you joining our team and working with us. And so we're going to be rolling out more and more of our co-hosts and the panel is growing. And so we'll see you shortly. Um Mitch, I'm going to let you, I, I can't remember what I said, but I think I'm going to let you share who our sponsors are. Yeah, for sure. And thank you for having me again, Julia. Excited to be here. Uh, wanted to quickly thank all of our sponsors that make the show possible. So today we're sponsored by Bloomerang, the nonprofit, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Fundraising Academy, 180 Management Group, Your Part-Time Controller, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Tech Talk, and the Nonprofit Thought Leader. So thank everybody for your support. Thank you. It's really great. And uh, you did a great job. Okay. All right. Derek Young Jr. <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank you all so much, Julia, Mitch. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be back. Yeah. Uh, so much to share, so many exciting things, um, so many things to unpack. So I'm excited to dig in. Well, good. That's a, that's a great attitude. That's a great place to start. <laughs> um, Mitch and I were talking, you know, in the beginning, Give us the quick recap, the elevator speech, whatever you want to call it, about leadership brainery. And if you could weave in your personal story, because it's really an interesting story. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and so really quickly, you all, uh, my partner, Jonathan Allen, and I, we started Leadership Brainery as a nonprofit in 2018. Um, and it was through our lived experiences of going to competitive graduate programs, master's and doctoral degrees, and being one of the only men of color in our program. And so I went to Tufts School of Medicine for my master's in public health. Um, I was the only Black man to come in in 2015. Uh, and, you know, at that time, um, you know, I was really thinking about how do we ensure that we have um, more equity um, in medicine? Um, and for me, that meant having more diverse perspectives in the classroom as we train our future practitioners and our future doctors and public health practitioners. Uh, and so I spent my time at Tufts really focusing on how do we create a more diversity in medicine. Um, and for me, that means advancing um, access to advanced degrees. Um, and then I went over uh, because I couldn't get enough of school. Um, I went to Boston University for law school uh, in my end of leaving BU. Um, but when I started, I was the only Black man to come in out of 250 students um, at BU Law, um, a top 20 law school. Uh, and so, again, you know, we were seeing these demands from the workforce, especially um, in the legal space and the STEM space, saying we need more diversity. Um, but when we go to a lot of the competitive schools that many of the um, top companies are recruiting from, um, they're not seeing the diversity in the schools. And so how are we um, ensuring that we're even changing the conversation from beyond um, helping uh, underserved and marginalized communities get to college, but get to the highest levels of education, master's and doctoral degrees. And there's not many efforts um, to help mm -hmm. folks get to the highest levels of education, but we know um, that there are certain occupations like being a, a lawyer, a doctor, a psychologist, a dentist, an architect, a professor um, that absolutely require advanced degrees. Mm -hmm. um, but then you have a lot of occupations who also um, prefer, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics has shared that the fastest growing segment of the workforce currently are jobs that are requiring either a master's or doctoral degree at entry level. 
Um, and wow. so if our communities don't catch up soon, we're going to continue to see this wealth gap widen um, because right now there are significant attacks um, on education and higher education um, and just knowledge um, as a whole in our country. Um, and we're seeing um, things roll back. And so for us at Leadership Brainery, we're pushing forward um, and going even harder um, because the attacks on our work um, are much more heightened than they were when we got started, um, Julie and Mitch, back in 2018. I think Mitch and I are just like, like, wow. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I mean, I just feel like those stats are must be widely underappreciated. Do you get this similar reaction when you share those examples that people can't even believe that's still the case today? Yeah, I get that reaction very often. Um, and again, it's just because we don't talk about graduate school often. Um, when we look at the 1970s, um, the American uh, Medical Association reported in the 1970s, we had more Black men in med school than we had in 2019, 2020, um, and going forward. And so, you know, there's been um, just these time periods um, in our country where we saw some upticks like in the late um, 70s and 80s, um, but then in the 90s and early 2000s, um, we started seeing things start to roll back, especially in the early 2000s with the recessions. Um, a lot of universities started being much more risk adverse and so opposed to um, admitting folks who needed more financial aid, like a lot of domestic um, marginalized communities, they um, really opened up the doors for more international students who could pay for tuition out of pocket. Um, and so we've seen a big switch um, in who are at our um, competitive schools in our country and as many um, international students opposed to uh, many domestic students. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay, now... You know, I love this background. I don't lo I don't love what's happened, but I love that you could be a, a part of something. Um, your partner's part of the same thing. You come out of undergrad all excited. And then you see these problems. So how did you translate this and, and craft your mission? Because this is kind of a, a heavy lift to even just explain, let alone serve. Yeah, it is. Um, and, you know, we're a leadership binary, so we focus on leadership. You know, how do we really ensure um, that, of course, we need folks um, at the entry level roles, but you can't stay there. You know, how do we have greater career mobility? And so we really shaped our mission around <clears throat> Leadership Brainery increases access to master's and doctoral degrees um, so that underrepresented communities can establish wealth for themselves um, and prosperity for their families, but then reinvest um, back in their communities. And so, you know, our theory of change really um, circles around how do we ensure um, underserved and low-income communities can access the highest levels of education, the highest level of the workforce, so then they can create wealth for themselves. But right now, what we're seeing um, is that even when you get into the workforce, if you don't have that career mobility to be to have decision making power, um, those decisions that impact marginalized communities um, are still not being um, implemented significantly because they're not at the table sharing their experiences, the experiences of their communities. And so, you know, our goal is to really increase um, diversity at the leadership um, level to make sure that when decisions are made, even when um, philanthropic decisions from a lot of those companies, from their C-suite, um, that we're at the table. So when they do um, even their charity work, um, they're doing it from an equitable lens. And I know you alluded to some some dynamics that have shifted recently around this topic, but do you mind going a little deeper on what some of the biggest changes have been since you set that mission in 2018 and how that's evolved to today? Oh, yeah. You know, th um, yeah. So three things that I could really hit on, on that come to my mind immediately um, is definitely, of course, um, the pandemic and George Floyd. I'm going to just put those as one. Uh, and so, you know, with, with those uh, spotlight on those two things, you did have a huge uptick um, in a lot of companies saying, hey, we want to support more diversity efforts, um, putting more money in. But I think anybody who's been in this work um, for a long time, um, rather you were in it in the 80s and the 90s or now, you know, those um, heightened spikes um, come down quickly. Uh, and so, you know, we saw a lot of money invested um, in 2020 and 2021. Um, and then we um, started seeing a lot of this talk around like a lot of book bans um, and anti-DEI movements. Um, and so immediately, you know, corporations started saying, oh, crap. You know, maybe I can't give money to diversity issues. Uh, maybe we do need to get rid of our chief diversity officer. Um, and so then we saw a, a quick um, downfall in our support from corporations. Uh, and, um, and now, 
this past summer when the Supreme Court overturned affirmative action that just heightened it even more. Um, and so then we start getting the backlash from the universities that we work with. And so a big part of our model um, is partnering with um, universities to recruit our talent. And so we have partner schools, they pay a fee uh, and they get a few different services from Leadership Brainery. Um, but I have never spoken to so many general counsels in my life, you all, um, this past year. And um, they are very fearful um, of partnering with us because we do serve um, underrepresented talent. And when we say underrepresented, um, we serve first generation, low income and people of color, um, but they have a hard time um, separating those three and they only hone in on the folks of color. And so they say, well, if you are serving directly people of color um, and you're partnering with our admissions offices, um, we can no longer support you um, or sign your contract because um, um, it's illegal to do um, diversity in admissions um, now, and so, or to use race as a determinant factor for admissions. Uh, and so, of course, that's not the case. You know, we do not do direct recruitment for institutions. We do much more exposure and outreach work. And so you come to us, we share all of our amazing pool of talent and they still have to apply like everybody else. So they may get accepted, they may not. Um, and so, you know, we feel like it's a very um, fair land, um, but, you know, I understand the the fear um, in some universities just not wanting to deal with um, with the lawsuits or potential lawsuits. But Derek, I mean, I just feel like this is such a great example I, that I think is shared by many nonprofit leaders where like your cause can move in and out of vogue, uh, to put it bluntly, um, swiftly and how big of an impact that has on your day to day. Like, how are you doing personally with all this? Like, how are you managing with that uh, change in receptivity. Like I just imagine that has to be really, really burdensome for you too. Yeah, it is, you know, but uh, you know, I think of course our students keep us going um, for sure. They're just absolutely incredible. They're doing so amazing, um, you know, in undergrad and currently now in graduate school. And so when we started LB, um, we had one very high touch program. Um, and that very high touch program was our ambassador fellowship. And so we were selecting um, a handful of students at that time from around the country. We've now localized it to um, Boston, where we're headquartered um, for that one program. Um, and so we select 20 students each year. They get personal, professional leadership development, um, free test prep, free admissions coaching. Um, and now our first year um, that this has been added, a $10,000 scholarship to go to graduate school. Uh, and so we're really excited about that. But, you know, what we really wanted to do with this small cohort was follow them for a couple of years, see if we can give them all of the support um, that they often um, don't have access to because of systemic barriers, whether it's cost or whether it's access. Um, but right now, when you think about some of the um, the prep companies um, in this space, like Kaplan or Princeton Review, um, to get a private admissions coach for graduate school is costing you between five and ten thousand dollars. Um, not including, of course, the application fees that every school um, requires. So like $100 application fee, when you get accepted, you got to give a seat deposit anywhere between like $500, $1,000. And then if you have to take the GRE, the LSAT, any standardized tests, you now have to pay for those tests or pay to retake those tests. And so, you know, you're talking about spending in preparation anywhere from five to $15,000. Uh, and so we eliminate all those barriers for our cohort of students to say, hey, if you didn't have to worry about cost, you know, if you didn't have to worry about access, you know, where will you go? Um, and we've seen our students now we have um, first generation low income students at, at Harvard Law School, at Columbia School of Journalism, at Cornell Business, at Boston University Med, um, at Brown School of Medicine. Like our students are just killing it, you know, across the board. And, you know, I mean, they're really just not only changing the trajectory for themselves, um, but their families and communities um, as well. And so, um, you know, I think being able to um, start there and then on uh, last time I was on the show, we were talking about our online platform that we acquired um, through some Harvard Law students. Um, and we were able to really expand our reach around the country in a more high tech, low touch way. And so now folks can sign up for our online platform. They can connect with our recruiters. They can share best practices on their journey to um, advanced degrees. We now have 1500 users that we're serving on that online platform from around the country. Um, and so we we have a few different ways to like pivot to make sure our students still get the support that they need um, without necessarily having the support of the institutions. 
Uh, and then I know we're going to go into um, some of our successes and challenges a little later. Um, but I think, and to answer your question, Mitch, um, this one last point um, is that we did not build leadership brainery to be dependent on large institutions because we already knew that we're in this position mainly because of these large institutions. Uh, and so we started off um, very grassroots uh, with individual donors, something that um, you know I tell a lot of nonprofit founders to take this approach. Um, and so we now have over 850 individual donors at Leadership Brainery. Um, out of our $1.2 million budget, um, individuals make up 75% of our revenue. Um, and you know it was really important for us to, to build a movement um, and to connect with folks' heart around the importance of education, the importance of access. Um, and you know when you got to go through the corporations who are only worried about mainly return on investment, or you know the corporate foundations who say that graduate school is a luxury and then they want to do all this reporting and all of this you know it's like hey let's go to our individuals um, rather you are giving ten dollars or we have individuals giving seventy five thousand dollars you know how do we ensure that those folks who actually care about the issues they're giving um, they're giving with their heart in the next year um, because they did that they're more likely to give again. Amazing, you know I've got to ask this and and you. You're such a, a positive leader and, and, you know, I think what happens when we are in nonprofit leadership, a lot of times we get new challenges and new things. I mean, did you in your wildest dreams think that the Supreme Court would come down with something that yeah. would change the trajectory of your conversations? I mean, right. So talk to us about these challenges and and not just the challenges, but to kind of piggyback on what Mitch said, how have you personally overcome this and not just thrown in the towel? Because this, this is a heavy lift. Yeah. Um, oh man, there's there's definitely so many challenges, but we continue to we continue to overcome things and you know, things I'm still learning. I mean, of course, leadership binary is very young, but I'm also a very young leader. Um, I'll be 31 this year. Uh, and when I started leadership binary. Um, what I was, um, I was 25, 26. Uh, and so, you know, it's definitely been an interesting journey for me even to learn, you know, how I manage and how I lead an organization and how I lead a team. Uh, but I would say the the first challenge that I just alluded to uh, was that we're in a very unique market. So we do graduate school access. And because, you know, there's not many other um, folks in our space, um, there's not a, a movement around. There's not a philanthropic pillar you know, around how do we ensure folks get into master's and doctoral degrees. And so oftentimes, you know, when we go to foundations, they say, well, we support K through 12 and college access, but, you know, that's, we don't support graduate school. That's like, you know, beyond college. And then, you know, and then they say, well, we have an economic empowerment pillar, but then that's job placement. And so, you know, you're all not doing job placement either. So, you know, are you really doing economic empowerment? And it's like, of course we're doing economic empowerment. We're creating lawyers and doctors and business folks. Uh, and so, you know, that's a very unique challenge for us. And um, we continue to get it, even when it comes to, um, like Mitch, how you, what you alluded to earlier, like folks not knowing much about the stats, like we don't have the data, we don't have the research, like we need more folks to do research on access to advanced education um, and the impact that it has on our communities. Um, we say something very often um, that sometimes we really got to walk people through, but is that all roads lead to graduate school. And that's us saying that graduate school is not for everybody. However, we have to understand how we're positioned um, and how we are um, dependent on these folks every single day. All of us need to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. you know, many of us go to the psychologist or a therapist, and many more of us need to go to therapists, right? Mm -hmm. You know, many of us need lawyers or every business, every nonprofit needs, needs a lawyer. Um, we all, you know, some of us go to college. And so your professor. Like, you know, do you want professors with diverse perspectives? And like all of those things that we interact with every single day, you know, many of those occupations, architects, you know, that are building our downtowns, building all of our infrastructures, like how are we ensuring that more folks have access to those occupations? Um, and because we interact with them every day, they're impacting our everyday lives. Um, and so we try to tell people like, hey, you know, graduate school may not be for you, um, but do you understand how it shows up in your life? Um, and so that's what we often say our roads lead to graduate school. And so, you know, that's one piece of us having to just continuously educate folks on what is master's and doctoral degrees um, and then also the importance in, in their lives. And, you know, my second challenge is 
Um, you know, because we are a small but mighty team, we've definitely grown significantly. So I have two new employees starting um, next Monday. And so we'll be a team of nine, um, which, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, it's really incredible. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, we have <clears throat> we have three folks on our programs team, um, three folks on our development team, uh, two folks on our recruitment team, and then you have uh, myself. Uh, and so the thing with myself, uh, is that, you know, as ED, I'm also HR, um, I'm also our finance and accountant, I'm also our compliance person. Uh, and so I think one challenge that, you know, that has brought um, is that um, a lot of the times if my team does have um, any concerns or challenges where in a larger company, they may go to HR you know, or they need something about their, you know, their pay stub or, you know, all that they may go to finance. And so being the person that everybody comes to, I think, you know, sometimes it, <clears throat> excuse me, it doesn't give that, um, that clear and comfortable um, position for folks to come to me about issues that they need to do to do their job, right? Because I'm also the person that if they need to be off or that they need the, um, you know, vacation time, I come and I approve it, or, you know, they feel like, will you not approve it? Uh, and so, you know, I'm trying to position ourselves more and more. And we're actually, um, we've been working with our operations manager as a consultant for a while, but, you know, I'm really excited to um, cultivate that role to see how do we have more of like the operations and chief of staff um, in the organization so I can show up for my team much more outside of those um, different nuance um, things that I have to do. And lastly, um, the third challenge that I would say that we've had is because we built Leadership Brainery um, as a very high touch and high tech um, organization. Um, tech is evolving like rapidly, like crazy quickly, especially with AI. And so, you know, as our students are in college, you know, they are like, you know, they're on it. Um, and so anything we're involved with, you know, they hope that that organization is on it too. Um, and so it's like, you know, okay, now how do we adopt AI? Like, you know, how do we do all these things of traditionally nonprofits are, you know, behind when it comes to technology. And so we're really trying to keep up with the pace um, because we were really trying to um, stay in touch with our with our base. I mean, that's been the challenge, um, but, you know, we're learning a lot and we're trying um, our hardest to make sure that we can serve them in that way. Amazing. Amazing. Um, Mitch, go ahead. I, I, no, I was I was, I was just going to say, Derek, I, I was previously founded and was running my own startup. It was a company serving nonprofits, but very similar experience. You've got nine people, like you're you're the one the buck stops with you and it's awesome to hear that you're taking putting the investing the time to build that infrastructure to hire the right people to start taking some of those things off your plate so you can excel but it's not a straight path it's like it's a windy road to figure out the right balance there so kudos to you for being mindful of that thank you thank you yeah it's amazing now you know you've overcome so much you've demonstrated that this is a really vital piece of success for, for so many different types of people, so many different communities. How would you kind of list out or quantify your achievements, given that, you know, you, you've you gone through a period of incredible disruption that was not of your own doing, right? right. You know, an, an existential, existential, you know, period of time across the globe how do you look at your achievements? What have your wins been? Yeah, yeah, we had some incredible wins. Um, and so I'm definitely proud of my entire team. And of course, you know, proud of our community, proud of our students. Um, I would start with, let me start with more of a programmatic um, with our students. Uh, and so one thing that I'm extremely proud of um, is back a year ago, um, and I would say almost two, we had this vision um, to build a department called um, Strategic Alliances. Um, and what we really wanted to do was ensure that we were partnering with other nonprofits, which um, is also really rare, um, yeah. that we were partnering yeah. with other nonprofits formally, like formal MOUs with other nonprofits to ensure that all of these organizations that are helping young people um, get to college. So whether you are middle school or high school and you're doing college readiness, you know, how are we ensuring there's a smooth transition to say, hey, I helped them get to college, but now many of them want to go to grad school and that's not what we do. We don't have the capacity. We don't have the expertise. Um, and so it's a smooth transition to say, hey, you know, we partner with Leadership Brainery. 
um, welcome to college, you want to go beyond that, you know, we have a partner for that. And so in the last year, we have um, signed on 16 strategic alliance partners, uh, which has been absolutely incredible. And it's really just shifted all of our work. And so now we have um, roughly 50,000 students in our pipeline, um, which again, you know, is so um, beyond me because just a few years ago, we were having a hard time getting students to apply um, for our programs again, because we were doing a lot of that. I'm um, trying to educate folks on the importance of advanced degrees. Um, but now my team spends so much time out in the community talking to middle schoolers, talking to high schoolers around the importance of advanced education. So then when they get in college, they know that they have to um, take the right classes. They have to get those internships between summers because all those things matter when you're applying to graduate school. They got to build relationships with their professors. Um, they got to do research. Um, if you want to do a PhD or you want to be into STEM. Um, and so we're telling them all these things early on. So when they first get into college, they're just not like completely lost and, you know, thinking about their next path after that. And so um, that's been incredible. Um, our team has been really great in bringing those in. And, you know, as we continue to work to cultivate them, I know it's just going to um, add so much value. We went from having um, in the previous years around, um, 40 applicants for our ambassador program um, to last year, we had 98 applicants for 20 slots. Uh, and this year, we already, our application just opened two weeks ago, and we already have over 200 nominations and over 50 applicants for 20 slots. And we have two months left in our application cycle. So I'm expecting about 200 to 300 applications. So that's Incredible. It's a testament to our strategic alliances, them getting the word out to their students. Um, but I just feel like more nonprofits need to partner um, when we are in a similar space or we do different things in that space, you know, and just how are we making sure that we are um, supporting our communities holistically um, and not just like um, um, keeping them um, in the uh, confounds of our work in particular. So that's been really great. So that's one thing that I'm really proud of. Uh, and then I would say on the operations side, um, we've adopted a couple of years ago, um, Asana as our project manager. Um, and that has been a transformative tool for the organization. Everything is in Asana. You know, if it's not in Asana, it doesn't exist. Uh, and so, you know, like all of our workflows, we've done so many like automations with our CRMs, our emails, our other databases um, to make sure that we have um, just strong systems. Um, and that's been really, really great. I talk to a lot of my nonprofit colleagues and nonprofits who've been around for um, for decades. You know, and I show them our sauna um, and all the automation. If we get one answer, we press it and it does all of this. Um, and they're just like blown away, you know, and I feel like, you know, so many nonprofits, um, you know, while, you know, capacity is an issue um, and just, you know, being able to adopt technology, you know, we're still doing a lot of documents and spreadsheets and Excel sheets and, you know, how are we ensuring that we are now adopted into this new age of technology and really, you know, making our work easier for us, um, you know, using more AI and tools and so forth. You know, we adopt all of that into Leadership Brainer and I've seen it transform our team, um, our quality of work, uh, and um, even our like uh, to, to be able to better address gaps. Um, we, we see those things through our goals and our metrics that we've been able to set up um, in Asana and so forth. So that's been great on the operational side, um, transformative. Uh, I love, the, oh, I love the, No, go ahead. Go ahead. I interrupted. Go ahead. I was just going to say, and lastly, on the developments that I already mentioned, um, I'm really proud of our development team um, just in five years and only three full time. Um, being able to now have a $1.2 million budget um, is just, you know, really incredible. Thank you all. We're really proud of that. Um, it's a testament to our community um, and them showing up for us and them really understanding the importance of our mission. And so um, that's been a huge success. Well, I, I'm just like, this is a fabulous way for Mitch, don't you think, to start the week? Oh, my God. Yes. I'm it's, like so inspired. Yeah, me yeah. too. Me too. Derek Young Jr., founder, executive director of Leadership Brainery. Check out their website, leadershipbrainery.org. It's beautifully done. It has a lot of video. It really goes into what the students look like, what the clubhouse that they have in Boston looks like, what they're doing, where they're doing it. It is so robust and it just continues to get better and better. Um, Derek Young Jr., I do not want to wait five years to get you back here, my friend. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. We cannot. We cannot. No. I can have a lot of updates for you next year. 
<laughs> I think so. I really think so. And um, I think when I was watching Mitch's face, when you started going through some of these stats, I think we were both just like mortified, right? And so to hear this journey and to learn more about this behooves us all. And it's something that we need to be understanding, right? As yeah. you know, yeah. as, our, as our culture changes and shifts. So really yeah. been fun to, to reconnect with you and to learn more about what's going on. Mitch, I'm going to let you take us out, my friend. Yeah. And I would just add to that. I'm so glad you also broke it down into some like operational, actional, actionable things other nonprofits can take from this, not just like headline pretty picture, but the tech you're using, your fundraising strategy, it's all great. So thank you so much uh, for sharing all that. Thank you to our sponsors again for today, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Fundraising Academy, 180 Management Group, your part-time controller, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Tech Talk, and the Nonprofit Thought Leader. Uh, thank you to all of you and to all of our audience. Uh, be sure you stay well so you can do well. Thanks for joining the Nonprofit Show. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Derek. We got to let you go. You're a busy man. Uh, well, thank, you. <laughs> thank, thank you all so much. And like we always say at Leadership Brainery, the best is yet to come. So thank you. Love it. I love it. That's a great way to end. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone, for another episode of the Nonprofit Show. Thank you, gentlemen. 